pleasure to introduce our next speaker, and that is Professor Julie Shaw. She's the Boeing Assistant Professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And she leads the Interactive Robotics Group in MIT's CSAIL. Remember that uh, one of our previous speakers is from CSAIL, the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. And Julie's going to talk about the new robot age and how uh, her work has examined the way that humans can work in the same environment and perhaps collaboratively with robots. Julie, it's a pleasure to have you. And hi. Hi, I'm delighted to be here today. I'm Julie Shaw, I'm assistant professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and I lead the Interactive Robotics Group as a part of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. My area of research is human-robot interaction and human interaction with autonomous systems. And what I specialize in is the software or the algorithms for these systems, specifically planning, decision-making, and control software. And how do we modify the behavior of these systems so that we can integrate robotics and autonomous systems more effectively in, into what today is still primarily manual work. So the larger vision behind what I do is aimed at harnessing the strengths of people and robots working together. I'm faculty in the aerospace department, so I have a particular interest in time-critical, safety-critical applications. The majority of my work is in the area of manufacturing and assembly. This is integrating robots to work with people on factory floors to improve the efficiency with which we build large commercial airplanes, do final assembly of cars, as well as smaller assembly, uh, such as electronics assembly. I also have a fair amount of research in other applications. One, one is disaster response. And the techniques I'm gonna to discuss today are, are applicable across uh, a variety of different domains. I'm gonna focus the discussion today on the area of manufacturing and assembly because of the audience, and also because what's happening in this area is, is truly revolutionary. It's incredibly exciting. And before we dive into um, what are new uses of, of advanced robotics in assembly manufacturing, let's start by talking about where we effectively use industrial robots today. Uh, for example, if we think about what is one of the most successful industries at deploying industrial robots to do assembly, many of us would think about the automotive industry. Um, how, how much of the build process of a car would you say is done by robotics and automation today, if you were to take a guess? What percentage? 40. Some say 40, some say 80. I heard an 80. 20? Oh my goodness. So you guys are actually targeting closer to, to what the real number is. So most people will say somewhere around 80 or 90 percent of the work of building a car is, is done with robotics or automation. The, the true number is closer to 50 percent. And uh, while most of the build process is done by robotics, it's the final assembly process that's still done primarily manually. And that final assembly process takes up half the factory footprint and half the build schedule of that car. Uh, and again, this is one of the most successful industries. Uh, this is an industry that has the resources to be able to redesign, structure their tasks and their environment for the current capabilities of industrial robots. Uh, they have potentially the in-house expertise to be able to program and reprogram these robot systems. There are another, a number of other industries which lag in their adoption behind the automotive industry. Building of large commercial airplanes, about 80% of this work is still done manually today. It's a beehive of people by hand putting together you know, a, a 777 or a 747. And um, uh, other industries uh, assembling electronics, 90% of the work involved in assembling a cell phone is still done manually today. Much of the work done by small business manufacturing is still primarily manual. And across these very different sectors, there are a number of different reasons for the lagging adoption of robotic systems, but there are a number of common reasons as well. And one of those common reasons is that um, typically when we talk about deploying a robot system today, this robot needs to be physically separated, caged, and removed from the rest of the human work. And the result is that when we walk into a factory, we see a split factory. One side is all robotic systems, and the other side is all people. Now, many of these primarily manual processes today in automotive final assembly and assembly of large commercial airplanes, et cetera, can actually be done by robotic systems. It's often not practical to take some of that work out that can be done by a robot, physically remove it, carve it out, put a cage around that system, uh, and, and, and effectively decouple it from the rest of the workflow. So we leave a person doing that work still today. Now, what's enormously exciting is that this paradigm is changing and factories of the near future are going to look very different than the factories we're used to seeing today. Uh, that's due to two different trends. 
one of the trends is that we're beginning to see the safety um, specs, uh, the technical specifications for safety standards, to put these large dangerous industrial robots on mobile bases and rails and have them move and work in the same space as people. So this is removing the physical barriers that are keeping people safe, keeping them away from the robot systems, and instead ensuring safety through sensing and through computation. So we remove the physical walls, instead we sense where the person is in the space, and then we slow and stop that robot as a person nears that robot system. So this is one trend. The other trend is um, what is an inherently new type of industrial robot hardware. These are being called uh, inherently human safe robots. I prefer the term mostly not dangerous because they can still hurt you. Uh, but the idea is that you can put one of these robot systems next to a person without a cage and without fancy sensing or computation. And if this robot happens to hit you, it won't permanently harm you in any way. So what's enormously exciting here is that through these new trends, through new uses in standard industrial robots, and through a, a new type of industrial robot hardware, we, we now have the flexibility to put these robots in places where traditionally we couldn't deploy them. And what I'm interested in my research is not how we make this safe, because we're seeing the hardware and we're seeing the safety standards to make this safe. What I'm interested in is how we make maximum use of the new flexibility that these systems afford us. How we make it not only safe, but how we make these robots intelligent enough that they can work efficiently in what is today still primarily manual workflow. And so to that goal, um, my research lab focuses on this challenge at two levels. One is at the larger level of the full factory. This is how we optimize the workflow of mixed human and robotic work in what's now a much more dynamic environment than we're typically used to deploying robot systems. And this involves new techniques for performing dynamic sequencing and scheduling of the factory work, taking into account that we now have interdependency or intercoupling between what work is done by people and what work is done by uh, robotic or automated systems. And wherever you have intercoupling with people, that leads to process time variability, uh, which is something that we ultimately need to adapt to if we don't want to see degradations in the, in, the, in the efficiency due to this process time variability. So I'll talk about our techniques for confronting that challenge at the, at the factory level. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we're working in uh, approving manual work uh, at, at sort of the one-to-one -one interaction between a person and a robotic system. So this is deploying a robotic system to really work next to a person and provide assistance in what is current day manual work. Usually this is performing the non-value added work, aiming to leave the person where the person still needs to work today, but improve the efficiency of the work that they're doing. So for the first challenge at the factory workflow level, if we think about um, you know, what, what we have on the left there is a cell from an automotive industry. And what we have in the center is a picture of a factory for building a large commercial airplane. And on the right is final assembly of cars. So even in the places where we have these multi-robot cells, um, where we can structure the task and these systems can perform their task over and over reliably, this is uh, an effective solution. But when we do have a need for a person to come into these multi-robot cells, which are caged, um, what we have is a situation where today, typically, the entire cell needs to be shut down for the duration that person enters the space. And this, this is okay if this happens once very occasionally, but if this happens multiple times during the shift, um, we have a problem. And so what we want are to develop the techniques for robot workers to be able to coordinate to adapt to disturbance more the way people do. So what we want is if a person needs to come into a multi-robot cell, uh, rather than shutting down that cell, we want that person to say they need a certain amount of space for a certain amount of time, and then we want to recompute the task assignment, the sequence, and the schedule for the robot work to provide strong guarantees that a person can enter a certain space for a certain amount of time without the robots accessing that space. And what this allows us to do is make concurrent progress in other work, which um, is not necessarily tied to the precedence constraints. So what this allows us to do is recoup some of that degradation due to an unanticipated disturbance in the workflow of even just a multiple robot cell. So in terms of real world applications, I'll take a moment to talk about a few from the aerospace manufacturing industry. In assembly of large commercial airplanes, uh, about, as I said, 70 to 80% of the work is still done manually. The work that isn't done manually, that's done in an automated fashion, is typically performed using uh, large um, monument-style automa automation systems. 
So up top is a, is a gantry style system for drilling of aerospace structures. And on the bottom is a gantry style system for laying down composite material placement. So drilling and composite material placement are a big deal in aerospace manufacturing. A 747 requires about one million holes to be drilled for assembly. Uh, and when it's not done with these systems, it's done manually still today. So what's exciting is that uh, we're seeing a shift from these monument style systems to more right-sized, reconfigurable robot systems, where now we have what look like more standard industrial robot manipulators with highly specialized end effectors. And these systems uh, can come to the piece rather than the piece coming to the fixed infrastructure uh, automated system. We can now put multiple of these robots on a wing or on a fuselage to drill or to lay down composite material placement. Um, one of the challenges is that uh, typically people do need to enter the space for inspection or for rework or for quality assurance, and that cell is shut down very frequently. So that's one of the challenges we're, we're looking to address here. And what we want to be able to task these systems with is uh, a, a more advanced tasking and scheduling system that allows us to do flexible work sequencing and scheduling. So what we want to do is be able to take as input the tasks to be performed, we take that as input as a temporal network, uh, which, you know, which, uh, which work packages um, uh, for drilling, for example. We need to take into account precedence constraints. So um, uh, some parts of work need to be happen, happen before other parts of work. We typically have upper bound temporal constraints. Some work needs to happen in first shift or second shift or needs to be grouped together because it uses a certain tool. We also typically have lower bound weight constraints. So we might need to wait a half hour for one coat of paint to dry before we apply another coat of paint. So we take in on the right there a temporal plan structure of the task to be performed. We also take as input which agents, human or robotic, can do which tasks, and also the spatial locations at which that work is performed. And what we want to be able to do is to dynamically compute a task assignment and a schedule to coordinate the work of multiple robots when they need to negotiate shared physical space and need to negotiate that shared physical space subject to both hard time-based and um, resource constraints. In other words, the time-based constraints, certain work needs to be done in certain windows. The simplest space-based constraint or resource constraint is that two robots can't physically occupy the same space at the same time or we typically have a safety radius around a robot system. A person can't come closer than a certain radius to that robot when it's, when it's working. And what we want to be able to do is optimize this adaptive work sharing process as a function of criteria which is usually domain specific. So we may want to minimize completion time. We may want to take into account information on robot reliability, history from previous runs. Uh, a big one is that we want to be able to be responsive to changing high-level guidance from an operator or a supervisor. And what that last one does is push us to really require that these algorithms compute quickly uh, in seconds or less so that we can have this interactive sort of system where we request time to go into the cell and are guaranteed the time. Um, so in terms of comp the computational challenge here, um, if you think about um, comparing this to proprietary systems out in, out in use in factories today, uh, a two or four agent cell, uh, say with about 50 tasks or so, it'll typically take a half hour, an hour or more to recompute a task assignment sequence and schedule after a disturbance to the plan. And again, that works okay if this is a very rare occurrence, but when this occurs multiple times during the shift, this is much too slow. So our challenge here is to develop a very fast technique for performing dynamic sequencing and scheduling of multi-agent work. And this problem for, of task assignment and scheduling can be formulated as a mixed integer linear program. Uh, it's a standard problem formulation where we're deciding who does what and in what order. The challenge here is that we have uh, a, a problem formulation which doesn't lend itself to the typical solution techniques. And the problem we have here is that we have temporal and spatial proximity constraints which are tightly intercoupled. So the typical way solution techniques solve this problem and scale it to large sizes is through decomposition techniques such as Bender's decomposition, where you're looking for an informative way to cut your problem, solve a smaller problem, and help that um, be informative for how to solve the larger problem. So in our case, robots um, are negotiating shared physical space 
And what that means is that the sequencing and timing of each robot's actions influences the optimality of the sequencing and timing of the other robot's actions, because they need to do this dance around each other in that space. And what that means is that the usual decomposition techniques we'd use don't provide informative cuts through the search space. We can't decompose this problem in, in a similar way. Um, another field that cares about this problem is um, tasking and scheduling of unmanned aerial vehicles. To give you a sense of the decomposition there, there there's a convenient one. We can decouple time and space. We can say there's a sector for a certain UAV to fly around, and once you assign it that sector, the order in which it visits the waypoints really doesn't affect the order that the other agents have to visit their waypoints, and that gives us a convenient decomposition. Here, time and space are tightly intercoupled, and we have to leave them as such. So what we need is another decomposition to help us solve this problem very quickly. And the way we approach the problem is to observe that we have two parts. We have an allocation problem of which tasks each robot does, and then we have the sequencing and scheduling problem. Once we've allocated tasks to robots, they need to happen in a certain order and in a certain time sequence. And the allocation of the tasks is not the real computational bottleneck. It's really the sequencing and scheduling of the tasks that's the computational bottleneck here that really turns this to a halt. And so what we do is develop a very fast, satisfying schedulability test that allows us to solve the scheduling problem very quickly in an approximate way. And what we do is we embed that solution technique within a standard mixed integer linear program solver to be able to solve the full problem very quickly and in a near optimal fashion. So how do we solve this, uh, this sequencing bottleneck? Um, we observe that there are many different communities that care about this problem. Operations research, uh, artificial intelligence scheduling works on this problem. Another community that works on this problem is real-time processor scheduling. So this is scheduling of tasks within the avionics processor, for example, of a commercial aircraft. And these different communities approach this problem in different ways. Uh, OR and AI methods typically um, are, are, are pushing towards complete solvers, which means if you get, give them a set of constraints and you say, can I schedule this, it'll give you back a definite, yes, I can schedule it, or no, I can't. Real-time processor scheduling, on the other hand, uh, is, is incomplete, and, uh, and, but instead, what they gain from that is um, very fast polynomial time techniques, analytical techniques for testing, um, yes, can I schedule this, or the answer you get back is I don't know. So it's not a yes or no, it's a yes or I don't know answer. And the goal is to design a tight test meaning the frequency with which you get back that I don't know is as small as possible. So you want the test to be tight or informative. So what we do is we approach this sequencing and scheduling problem from a real-time processor scheduling perspective. And what we do is we model the robots or the agents. They might be robots, they might be people. We model them as processors, for example, within a multi-core computer. And we model the shared physical space that they need to access to do their work as shared memory resources in a multi-core computer. And what we have is a problem where we need to assign tasks, sequence, and schedule the tasks for the robots such that they access these shared memory resources under mutual exclusion. And what's special about this problem and is different than what's been studied in the past is that um, uh, we have these lower bound weight constraints. They're actually what causes the computational complexity. That weight constraint that we need to wait a half hour for one coat of paint to dry before we apply another coat of paint. And what's interesting is that this is a problem that's of increasing interest to the real-time processor scheduling community as well because of the increasing prevalence of physics processing units and graphics processing units. So we can take what, what is a manufacturing problem in, in the sense that we care about it, and we can actually formulate it as uh, a model that's used in the real-time processor scheduling community. It's called a self-suspending task model. And, uh, and there's been effort in this community to design fast, satisfying schedulability tests for this particular model. Now, in terms of the problems that have been solved previously, um, the way people design tests for these self-suspending task networks is they restrict the behavior of the scheduler and then leverage the structure of the network, do an analysis of the structure of the network to tightly bound the temporal resources necessary to execute the task set. So the this, this sort of techniques people have developed in the past for these networks uh, solve problems that look like this. For example, tight tests exist for networks where we have one task that's broken up into any number of precedence-related subtasks. That on the left there is that top line of one, two, three subtasks. 
And then we have any number of singleton tasks. And what we're looking to do is how we nest the singleton tasks within the wait times of the, of, of the um, uh, wait constraints between those subtasks. So in other words, we're restricting the structure of this problem in order to be able to develop a tight analysis of its schedulability. The other structure that's been studied is any number of tasks, but each task only has two subtasks. So that's another structure that's been studied. But these are very restrictive in terms of um, representing real world problems in, in the domain that we care about. So what we've done is generalize these previous techniques to be able to analyze the schedulability of task sets which have any number of tasks, each of which can have any number of subtasks. On top of that, we allow more general task-to-task -task temporal constraints than are typical in a processor scheduling problem. And uh, we generalize these uniprocessor, these single processor approaches, to a multiprocessor approach with shared memory resources. What we have is a significantly more complex problem than has been studied in the past, but we take inspiration from the techniques of solving these uh, previous problems to develop an analytical schedulability test for uh, this more general structure. And the way this works is, um, let's talk about how it works for one robot or one processor. Um, the way we solve this problem for one processor is we do an analysis of what is the minimum of time it'll take for one processor to execute this task set. Well, that's the sum of all of the task costs, at the very least. And then what we do is we do an analysis of how the weight constraints and the upper bound deadlines interact. And we do this analysis in a particular way because this is where the complexity of the problem really comes from, is through the interaction of the lower bound temporal constraints and the upper bound temporal constraints. So even for one robot or for one processor, this problem is already NP-hard. It's shown to be NP-hard, which means it's exponential in the number of choices you have in the task set. So what we do is recognize that when the lower bound temporal constraints and the upper bound temporal constraints interact, there's very little we can do about it. The most conservative estimate that we can come up with is just to say that those lower bound weight constraints, which are embedded in upper bound temporal deadlines, are just going to be pure idle time for our task set. So we, we, we tag those as pure idle time. And then for the remaining lower bound weight constraints, we do what we call a Russian dolls test, a Russian dolls analysis. What we're looking for is a worst case nesting of all the lower bound constraints into the upper bound constraints. It's a worst case nesting. And that also provides us a conservative estimate for uh, the additional idle time that contributes to our total um, uh, resources necessary to execute the task set. And so this is the first closed form schedulability test for testing self-suspending task networks with any number of tasks and any number of subtasks. It is approximately one or two lines in MATLAB. It's extraordinarily fast. And what I'll show you next is that it's tight, meaning it's an informative test as well. So first to show you that it's fast, what we're doing here for the single processor case is comparing this to um, uh, the fastest AI solvers for this sort of problem, CTAT, um, uh, circuit sat and, and TSAT plus plus. And typically these solution techniques will time out. That's a red bar showing 30 minutes there. Typically these solution techniques will time out at about 30 minutes with task sets of about 100 tasks. We're able to schedule task sets with up to 10,000 tasks, often in about a second or less. So orders of magnitude improvement in computation time. You don't get something for nothing. So in terms of the quality of the solutions we produce, this is highly dependent on how many lower bound temporal constraints we have in the network. Uh, when about one quarter of our temporal constraints in our network are lower bound weight constraints, then we're able to produce solutions with the, which are within about 10% of the true optimal. And this is the range that matches the real world task sets that we schedule um, for industrial applications. So what we did next was take this single uniprocessor schedulability test and generalize it to the multi-agent setting or the multi-robot setting. And when we do that, the problem is that we produce highly conservative schedules. If every robot is reasoning on the worst case execution of every other robot, it becomes very conservative. So what we do is we take the schedulability test, we reformulate it as a light schedulability test and use it in a, in a simulation scheduler. So what that allows us to do is use this test to say, if I make this temporal commitment right now, can I guarantee there's a feasible path going forward that will meet all my constraints? If so, I go ahead and I make that commitment and I continue on. 
And by embedding this in the simulation loop, it's advantageous because every time we make a commitment, we've reduced all uncertainty with what's happened in the past, and it allows us to make less conservative schedules going forward. So what we do is we take this sequencing um, schedulability test, and we embed it in a simulation loop, and then we use this sequencing subroutine as a subroutine within the larger optimization to do both task allocation and sequencing and scheduling. We iterate between task allocation and sequencing and scheduling till we find a schedule that meets uh, our objectives. And in terms of the performance of the system for multi-robot multi systems, we're comparing uh, here the black line is uh, a complete solution technique. It's a complete optimal solution technique. And uh, typically, these will time out somewhere around five agents, uh, 50 tasks or so. And um, our solution technique is able to generate schedules for, we've extended this out to 700 tasks and 10 agents, uh, usually in about 10 seconds or less. So this is a, a very fast algorithm still, even in the multi-agent case. And what we're able to show is that it does also produce near-optimal solutions. So for the size problems we can benchmark against, uh, we're able to show that we achieve solutions within, with, which are within about 10% of the true optimal. What happens at 10 agents and 700 tasks, we don't know because we have nothing to benchmark against, but we can solve these problems in tens of seconds, which is nice. We've also um, compared this work to proprietary techniques used in industry for solving similar problems. And uh, all of the problems we've benchmarked against demonstrate that we produce schedules which are about um, 10 to 20% um, uh, shorter in make span than is produced by the proprietary software. In terms of capability that this provides us, so this is an example from the aerospace manufacturing domain. This is a multi-robot system building up a fuselage. If a person needs to come into that space, they simply, they simply request that space for that amount of time. If a robot fails, like that top middle robot, the system recomputes, it reallocates, it resequences and reschedules the work to continue to make progress. It provides interactivity so you can change deadlines on the fly. You can set accelerated deadlines for certain parts of the work and the system figures it out. Uh, this is a problem with um, five agents, about 200 tasks, and we recompute in a second or less in this case. So this is one instance of how to apply these techniques. We're also looking at how to apply them to do dynamic sequencing of work on assembly lines. Uh, for example, in an automotive assembly line, if your cars are not moving on fixed structures but are freely mobile, you can swap work or skip stations based on the customization of that car. It allows you to potentially change what the fixed point in the factory is where a feeder line meets up with the main line. Um, there's also applications in, just in terms of real-time processor scheduling and, and other scheduling problems for this technique too. But we do see it as an enabling technology, allowing us to use robots in a much more flexible way than we could previously, which again is very inter important if they're interdependent on work which has process time variability. So that's a little bit about the technology that we've developed to do dynamic sequencing and scheduling of work at the factory level. And what I'll do with the um, about 10 minutes or so I have remaining is talk a little bit about one-to-one -one interaction with robot systems and how we can improve the efficiency of manual work through robotic assistance. Now, I mentioned that, um, did I mention? I had the wonderful opportunity of working out at Boeing before starting on the faculty uh, in robotics for manufacturing. And what I learned from my time on the factory floor is that uh, people who don't work in manufacturing are always very surprised by this, but people who do aren't. I was just blown away to learn that the plane is actually built differently from day to day and shift to shift, uh, and that important aspects uh, you know, are well specified, but wherever you have manual work, you develop highly individualized styles for performing this work, especially in these team-based environments. And so as a roboticist, thinking about how it is we design a robot or task a robot to do some of this work, this poses a challenge because you can't just program the robot once to do the work with anybody. Uh, that robot actually needs to change in slight but important ways the way it does its work so that it conforms effectively with that particular style for how that particular team executes the work. So that, gives, that, that presents a challenge to us here. If we think about an implementation of the safety standards for people to work with potentially dangerous industrial robots, the implementation of the safety standards looks something like this. 
So as the, robot near, as the person nears the robot, the robot slows and stops. When the person pulls out of the way, the robot continues on its work. Again, as the person reach in, reaches in, the robot slows and stops. This enforces safety. So this is always running in the background. But you can see here that um, the person really has the potential to slow and stop this robot just about constantly and potentially destroy the benefit of introducing such a system. So what we do here is look at how we can develop statistical models of human behavior, how we can observe how people are doing work today, and automatically translate that into robot task plans that are adjusted slightly so that they conform to how people are doing work today. And what that allows us to do is reduce the amount of slowing and stopping time of these systems. We always preserve safety, but now that allows us to increase the efficiency of the interaction as well. And so in our lab, we, as I said, we did do an implementation of um, these forthcoming safety standards, the technical specs for the safety standards. This requires, even just for the safety component, it requires a very low latency system. And, what we, and, um, and it, there's also other considerations as well. So what is the function you use to slow and stop this robot? That actually matters because there's physical safety, but there's also psychological safety of a person working with these systems. So even though it's just as safe for a person to zoom towards you and then stop within that safety radius, people generally like to see a decay. They like to be able to anticipate how that robot is going to behave as it's nearing them. And so we investigate different curves for that sort of interaction. Um, we can also demonstrate very low latency of the system. Um, for example, 99.99 probability, we're able to demonstrate latency loops which are less than 15 milliseconds, which is appropriate for, for, for the interaction we conduct in the laboratory for our experiments. Um, but this is only the first step, as I mentioned. So really, the follow-on work we've done in the laboratory has been looking at how we design mechanisms for programming these robots that conform to the specific styles that people use for doing their work. And that allows us to ultimately increase efficiency of the interaction. And if we look at how we train robots to do work today, we usually don't train robots to work with people. The ways we train robots are designed for one-way transfer of information from the person to the robot. And many of these techniques, the reinforcement learning, look like um, the way we train dogs, for example. So the robot does something and you say good. The robot does something and you say bad. And over time, it learns your implicit preferences and it figures out how to do the task. So unfortunately, the, that explicit style of training through interactive reward, through explicit commanding, that's actually documented as one of the most inefficient techniques for people to lear, learn how to work with other people. So what we were interested in exploring was, can we modify a standard reinforcement learning algorithm based on insights of effective human team training? And can we demonstrate improvements in objective and subjective measures of team fluency and coordination in a human robot team because we make these changes? And the changes we made uh, are based on um, a, a typical way of, of, of training human teams. It's the gold standard in human team training. It's called cross-training. And that's where people switch physically switch roles with other people. So I do my job, you do your job, and then we take turns and we switch roles. And it's a well-documented effect that something about physically taking someone else's role not only teaches you how to do your job, but when you come back to doing your job, it teaches you what your partner needs to be successful as well. And people are very good at incorporating that into their own knowledge and changing how they do, changing how they do their work to also support the rest of the team. So what we wanted to do was promote this sort of natural behavior we see that emerges uh, during human team training and cross-training. What we did was conduct an experiment where we, train, we had people train robots using the standard reinforcement training technique, and we had people train robots uh, doing this cross-training procedure. Underlying it is the same learning algorithm, but small modifications so that the learning algorithm is taking the inputs through cross-training rather than through explicit assignment of reward. We, trained, we, we benchmarked it against uh, the human reward assignment, the algorithm SARSA lambda, which is widely used in the robotics domain for many tasks, but again, primarily for, for tasks that require one-way transfer of information from a person to a robot. And what we did was uh, conduct large-scale human subject experiments. We had 36 people come into our laboratory. They were randomly assigned to two groups, one in which they trained to work with the robot through cross-training, and one using the standard reinforcement learning algorithm, training through reward assignment. We had them trained to work with the robot actually in a graphical user interface environment, just a point and click GUI, and not with a real robot. 
And, and that's potentially interesting because if we see a transfer of learning from a virtual environment to working with a real robot, that means we don't actually need to put a person physically next to a robot for them to learn how to work with the robot. There's a big benefit towards training off of the operational environment. So after people trained in this virtual environment, we had them perform the task with a real robot. We measured objective measures of team fluency, such as um, concurrent motion and idle time. We also measured the robot's uncertainty in the person's next actions. And at the end, we uh, provided a questionnaire where we could gain subjective feedback of the person's experience of working with this robot. I'm going to show you two videos. The first video is the execution after uh, the person has trained to work with the robot using the prior state-of-the-art technique where the person assigned reward to the robot when it did something good or when it did something bad. The task is a place and drill task. So the person places three screws in, and the robot then drills the screws in. And people were allowed to train that robot to do this task any way they wanted. So for example, the very smart people knew that this was a very dangerous robot and actively tried to train the robot to stay out of their way till they finished placing their screws and then have the robot drill. Other people wanted to execute the task as efficiently as possible and wanted as much concurrent motion as possible. And I'll show you two videos of that latter type just for consistency here. So in this video, the person places the first screw and you kind of see they're hesitating, they're waiting to see if the robot's going to move. Finally, they make their move. And when the robot starts moving, they pull their hand out of the space. They wait till the robot stops moving. And then finally, they go to place the last screw. So qualitatively, it seems like the person is unsure about when the robot's going to move, what it's going to do next. And there's hesitancy in that interaction. Now, in contrast, I'll show you a video of the task execution after cross-training. This is the person and robot faking of switching roles in that virtual environment. And here, the interaction looks very different. So the person is much more comfortable being in that same space. Oops, let me try that again. Is much more comfortable being in that same space as the robot is moving. Seems to have a better idea of what the robot will do next. And these two videos weren't cherry picked. So actually, what we did see were very robust, statistically significant results that after cross training, the human's idle time was reduced by 41%, and concurrent motion was increased by 71%. And while we can't measure the person's uncertainty in what the robot will do, we can measure the robot's uncertainty in what the person will do. So we can measure the robot's statistical model of the person's behavior. And what we did see was that after the three training rounds in simulation, after that third trial, the robot was statistically significantly more sure about what the person would do after cross-training than they were using the prior state-of-the-art technique for training the robot. And there's two reasons we might see this result, and the two reasons are confounded. One is that the robot is developing a better model of what the person is likely to do because the inputs through cross-training are more informative in some way, and we do see evidence of that. The other reason might be that the person is actually uh, gaining a better understanding of how the robot will behave and is converging to a workflow with that robot more quickly. And we also see evidence that that, that is a component to this as well. So there's, there's two reasons. Uh, we can't pull out the individual contribution, but we do see two reasons uh, for this effect in the data. Finally, in terms of subjective measures, we did see statistically significant dis differences. People agreed more strongly that they trusted the robot after cross-training and that the robot performed according to their preference. And ultimately, these measures are, um, are arguably more important than the objective measures in terms of adoption of robot systems. So what, what does this allow us to do? So this allows us to implement a human-aware motion planning algorithm if the robot develops an adequate um, statistical model of what the person will do next that allows us to potentially modify the sequence of the robot's actions or the robot's motions itself to maneuver around the spot where the human is likely to be. And that allows us to reduce that slowing and stopping during that interaction. It allows us to increase the efficiency of the interaction. So we did conduct, again, large-scale experiments looking at human-aware motion planning using a good model of what the person would do next. And we did see a 6% faster task execution using the risk-aware motion planning, as well as nearly a 15% increase in the mean separation distance between the person and the robot. 
So what that means is we don't have to think about trading safety for efficiency when we include a little bit of uh, adaptivity on these robot systems. Actually, by strategically making the robot adaptive in the right ways, we can increase the efficiency of the task and we can improve safety, where safety here, the proxy for safety, is uh, making that separation distance between the person and robot larger. So we can potentially get the best of both worlds here. And so these experiments I, I showed you in the context of a fixed manipulator on a table. We're also looking at similar challenges, but with mobile manipulators as well. We see a similar problem, whereas a robot navigates up and down an assembly line with lots of people, and that robot doesn't know where those people are going, that robot just slows and stops a lot. And it can't really get to where it's going in a timely manner. So similar techniques um, to be able to anticipate where the person is and develop motion plans that move around that person uh, are currently in development. And um, this is a system which um, we're working with BMW to develop. It's a mobile robotic assistant, which is designed to deliver the tools and materials on the automotive assembly line. So this challenge we solved in the first year of this project was just enabling this robot to move on and off a moving floor assembly line. It needs basic mobility before it can do fancy things like deliver tools and materials to people. Um, and so um, we're currently developing the motion planning algorithms for it to navigate freely across a floor in a human environment. Okay, so with that, I can, I can wrap up. So the larger picture of what we do in the group here is that we're aiming to improve the efficiency of manual work through the strategic use of robotics. And our guiding principle is that we want to be able to preserve the natural flexibility people have in doing their work. We don't want to make people robots. Instead, we want to make the robots just smart enough to preserve the flexibility that people need to do their jobs well and maintain safety, but then improve efficiency through this little bit of adaptation. And we develop the algorithms for planning, decision-making, and control. We look at modifying these algorithms so that they work effectively with people. And we demonstrate the benefit of our algorithms through human subject experiments. Um, and uh, with that, I can wrap up and take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shah. This is absolutely fascinating. And, um, it really brings to mind for me what the possible future is. Thinking about this technology that, I mean, I like the, you've shown them the robots being in cages and it, I think we have to think about how these things can apply. And that's the challenge I'd like to use uh, some of the time we have in the, between now and when Professor Shaw has to leave. So we'll open up for a couple of questions, but I would like to come back and ask you, how do you imagine the future is gonna be with these kinds of enabling developments? The robots are not in cages anymore, they're actually interacting. Um, so anyways, but let me just turn it over and ask who might want to start with the first question. Hi, my name is Juliet McComas. I hope you don't get bought by Google. <laughs> I work for GSK, a pharmaceutical company, and our lab scientists work with a lot of glass. Um, if this is a solved problem, let me know. I think it's a partially solved problem. I've seen examples of wine glasses being picked up um, mm -hmm. or putting a label onto a bottle to improve the vision system. But um, can you tell me what you think the state of the art is for being able, robots being able to work with glass? To work with glass. So um, in terms of manipulation challenges, um, my area of expertise really is in the, the task level and motion level planning of systems. So in, in terms of the state of the art of, of working with glass and, and the vision challenges, um, I, I'm probably not the right person to comment. I can tell you that the manipulation challenges, is also in the applications that I work in, they're among the hardest in robotics. So um, for us, it's flexible materials, manipulation of flexible materials. It's um, uh, bins which are provided to you with parts that are unstructured, so I don't have a good sense whether your glasses are coming in nicely structured bins or, or less structured. Um, I have seen some efforts looking at um, pick and place of less structured bin environments. Um, ultimately, so, and I don't have a sense of how many types of, of glasses you have too. Um, the, the thing I can comment on is for automotive versus aerospace, um, manipulation challenges are, are an order of magnitude apart. So for cars, you have about a thousand different types of parts. Um, and 
even that is too many. We don't have a nice universal manipulator that kind of conforms to every different shape. So what you're looking at is designing specialized end effectors for every different shape you have to work with, and that becomes cost prohibitive. Uh, building a large commercial airplane, you have 100,000 different parts. So the manipulation challenge there is just uh, extraordinary and is, is a, long, you know, a, a long horizon away. So a lot of the work we do uh, actually really focuses on leaving the person to do many of those manipulation challenges, installation of flexible materials, or picking of various objects of different sizes and different shapes. That's actually a place where, for the time being, people are really well suited. We don't need specialized end effectors for all these different parts. And so when we look at deploying robot systems, we look at deploying them in the, uh, in the support of those manipulation tasks. So it's almost as if you're looking to treat the person as a surgeon and have the robots assisting that person so that they can spend uh, the absolute most time they can doing the work that truly still needs to be done by a person. So bringing them the bins, bringing them the tools and parts, and having them then do the fine manipulation. Um, but um, you know, manipulation challenges, I, I guess, are, are up there. It's one of our, our biggest challenges still. So Professor Shaw, along the same lines, what would you say are the industries and the specific applications that you think are the most promising for your work? Yeah, so um, one of the, I guess, I've had, a, I've had the wonderful opportunity to tour many different factories, from automotive to aerospace to, build, to assembly of submarines, uh, electronics. And one of, the, one of the things that's interesting to me is people bring me through the factories usually because they say they have a human-robot interaction problem, because that's what I do. And I usually go in pretty suspicious. So when I see the task they want to do through human-robot interaction, my question is, well, why don't you just want a robot to do that whole task? You know? And as, as, a, uh, as on the first look on many tasks, it seems like you really want a robot to do that whole task. And the common uh, points, which are really interesting, which are the use cases for the work that we do, the common points are, you know, even on first look, if it looks like a robot can do that whole job, uh, oftentimes that's not true because there's some component of judgment, human judgment or artistry to that work um, that it would just be enormously difficult for us to program still today. And so the art is really looking at manual work and trying to understand where is that human judgment, where is that artistry, where is that special decision making which still needs to be done by people. The other one that's common are the dexterous tasks. So dexterous tasks um, for some time still need to be done by people. And then looking at how we can carve out the rest of that work, which often can be done by robotics today. Uh, how do we make it safe and then how do we make it efficient? So by deploying a robot system to do this work, we actually see um, a significant enough efficiency benefit to make a business case for it. So um, I guess uh, I'm biased because I tour specifically areas that are primarily manual today and are, are particularly hard to transition over to robotics. Um, uh, but those show up everywhere, as I mentioned. In industries, you wouldn't even, you would assume that you know, they, they have this pretty much figured out. But there's still an enormous manual uh, amount of manual work, for example, even in the automotive industry. Are there particular industries that you want to work with? I'm, so the, I do a lot of work with industry, um, part, partly because I, was, I worked out at Boeing before starting on the faculty. Uh, but for me, working with industry is, is very exciting because for our algorithmic work or for our planning work or for our interaction work, there's always you know, about a dozen different directions at any point in time that we could branch off into explore next. And through conversations and interactions with industry, it helps us understand what portion of those have a potential business case behind them, have someone that really you know, could make use of this technology in the nearer term. And that helps us to, to design our next research steps in a way that's, that's relevant and that we can see the translation um, in, in a sooner time frame than maybe is typical in academia. Um, and so for that reason, you know, I, I mentioned the applications that I know well, that I've studied, but there are many that I haven't. And so, for example, picking up glass, that's something I'll pay closer attention to in the future to try to better understand you know, the manipulation challenges. Um, so I'm, I'm open to your, your thoughts and suggestions as well, what, what areas we should be thinking about applying this to. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm here at MIT as well in CTL. I have a question. You, you mentioned the 50% of the car or autos are put together by robot and 50% manual. What do you think that percentage will switch to in the next year, five years, 10 years, and beyond? Yeah, so I, I really do believe we're headed for a paradigm shift. 
Um, and I think uh, a lot of this is coming from um, low-cost technologies such as the Baxter robot. They're easy to try to deploy to do a lot of this work. And um, in the automotive industry in particular, there's many industries with this which require manipulating smaller objects, lighter payload objects, uh, and working in very close quarters with people that still need to be doing some of the dexterous work. Um, I, think, I think that the, the new enabling hardware systems are really allowing us uh, experimentation on a, on, a, uh, on a level that we haven't seen before in terms of integrating robots in places we typically haven't. Uh, a part of me also believes that there are you know, millions of standard industrial robots out there that have capabilities that the inherently human safe ones really can't, particularly heavy payload capabilities. Um, and that's something that people don't like to do, right? Lift heavy objects. Um, that's something that really suits itself well to a human robot interaction solution. So um, I think we're only just seeing the beginning of what's happening here. And, and my belief is that in the next five years, we'll begin to see um, many of these pieces of manual work transition over. And it's not about replacing people. So ultimately, the more I understand and learn about these applications, it's not about deploying robots to replace people. That's a long, long way away from much of this work. It's, and it, it's a potentially harmful idea, too, to think about replacing people. The more, the more um, I think, fruitful approach is to really try to understand what is the right division and how do we strategically introduce robots in what still needs to be manual work for some time to improve the efficiency? And I think we see that mindset in a number of different industries. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm very optimistic. Manny? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering uh, how you are handling the stochasticity in your optimization, because that's kind of designed for deterministic when you're scheduling Correct. it. Correct. So I was yes. just wondering about that. Absolutely. So the techniques that I presented for the dynamic scheduling, uh, first of all, it, it's a deterministic solution, and, uh, and we're using a centralized approach for solving the problem. So we use a centralized approach rather than a distributed approach because our constraints are so tightly intercoupled. It lends itself to a centralized approach. And in a factory, we have full communication connectivity and bandwidth, typically, to be able to implement a centralized approach within a cell. Now, our techniques are deterministic. Um, what that means is we're not, we're not explicitly reasoning on the stochasticity in the environment. We don't get a sort of hedging behavior about what we think we might be uncertain about in the future. Now, we address this um, uh, partially, and then our ongoing work is moving towards um, distributed systems and stochastic approaches. So the way we address this in, in the current technique is that when we produce a schedule, we're not producing uh, a schedule with fixed time points, as would be typical. So task A starts at time one, task B starts at time two. What we do is we compute flexible windows. We compute a flexible scheduling policy to execute. So uh, that requires some computation online. So every time something actually executes, we update the future windows of all future time points, expanding them or shrinking them just a little bit based on what we've seen happen so far. And while this is still a deterministic technique, it provides some robustness to small deviations in the schedule. And as long as you're hitting within these windows, you still have a strong guarantee you'll meet the constraints of your problem, which is powerful. Um, ultimately, we can gather information over time about typical bottlenecks, typical issues that arise, and we can pre-design the schedules to be robust to these sorts of issues. So we are, um, for, for, for the problems we've studied, the centralized deterministic approach is sufficient for real world applications. We're now looking at scaling this from one cell in the factory to multiple cells and doing coordination across a much larger factory area. There we have natural decompositions because we have these natural decompositions of cells. And now we do want to take into account stochastic information. It's not just enough to hit a replan button. There, the complexity of the full process really requires, uh, you know, you're, you're really concerned about cascading effects throughout the process. So we do want to explicitly reason on the uncertainty um, in the schedule execution. And I'm happy offline to talk um, more about, about those techniques. Um. <clears throat> So you're just getting back to, to Jim's original point, which is the application to supply chain. And we talked about this before, I think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there are two areas that we talked about, and one is um, how there's an increasing customization of products. Uh, so your, your algorithm will enable robots to be reprogrammed very quickly. So therefore, the end result could be the production lines will be more flexible. So we have a, a sudden change of, of color or whatever it happens to be, or feet, product feature, 
then this will make those production lines more, more flexible. Would that be a, a, a reasonable Absolutely. conclusion? Absolutely. So I talked about one of the motivations here for why you'd want to do dynamic scheduling, which is process time variability, or people as a part of the process, um, which, which le leads to the desire to be able to recompute online as you see variations in the nominal schedule. Another, another piece that, that drives that is potentially uh, further up, more customized um, uh, uh, product orders, um, wanting to be able to be more responsive to um, needs from customers, be able to reorganize, resequence, um, rebalance your line based on uh, whatever customization set you happen to have at that time. So these techniques are useful for that as well and are potentially enabling technology in, in terms of supporting um, allowing that more freedom in terms of customization as the orders come in. And the second area was, I think we discussed, was um, in, in just in time and uh, supplying components and materials to the production line, uh, improved synchronization and sequencing. And maybe you could say a little bit about that and how that might affect GIT. Sure, so um, uh, if you have late parts or disturbances, um, if something you know, is a little late, this provides the ability within seconds to resequence, reschedule your work so that you can still make hard deadlines on, on delivery dates, for example. Ultimately, it's not um, a characteristic of a particular type of disturbance. It's really any disturbance in the schedule due to any reason that this, um, that this would provide value for. So, uh, and that's different for different industries. Um, now, the, in terms of the set of problems we solve, we do rely on a particular constraint structure to make this solution technique efficient, and it's a constraint structure that is designed for the particular manufacturing environments that we've studied. So for example, what this will not do is routing problems, routing of aircraft across the country or routing of trucks. It won't solve a traveling salesman problem, and that's inherent in the computational technique because we model robots as processors accessing shared memory, you assume the time it takes to access the shared memory is constant for all agents. What that means is we're not explicitly modeling travel times across a factory. So in a cell, we assume travel time is relatively constant and small. So there is a particular class of problems this would solve. Um, uh, disturbances due to late parts or other variability uh, in materials changes in windows under which things need to be delivered, all those are easy for us to handle. Changes in travel times or routings, these, this technique is, is not the right technique to apply. So I'm Lee Shorter, I'm also from GSK. And I was wondering in all these algorithms that you're thinking about, um, are you giving consideration to uh, how people that aren't robotically trained can easily you know, modify the robot to do another task. Yes, yes, yes. So that's the other, that's the other big challenge. To, uh, one, one of the other reasons for the lagging adoption of robotic systems across the different industries I mentioned, it's that oftentimes um, industries don't have the in-house expertise, or it's very time consuming to reprogram and reconfigure this robotic system to robotic line to be able to um, do small batch or um, you know, just, just turn the line over. Uh, and meanwhile, a person can come in and you can say, now you build it this way. And then the person builds it that way. And that's much easier than reprogramming a robot. So the techniques that I mentioned later on, uh, we have a line of work um, since, um, since these papers came out, which is focused primarily on basically being able to watch people do work, take motion capture of them doing work, and be able to automatically translate that into the robot task plan that conforms to the robot's kinematics and dynamics so that you can literally show a robot how to do the task. It takes that as a seed. It uses its own motion planner to then design um, uh, motions that do that same thing. So in other words, that, that's another area we're, we're aiming to chip away at is to reduce that burden of programming and deploying the robot systems. It's another game changer. Thank you, Julie. I want to ask a couple of questions to the audience, if I could. So um, how many of your organizations use robots in your production operations now? All right, a fair number. And among those, how many do you think uh, this is, for you, this is news? This is sort of new information? Some, yeah. And for those of you, perhaps Ralph, I'm not sure if you'd be willing to talk, how do you think this will affect your operations? Could I trouble you to answer that? I really don't know. 
<laughs> I'm not in that area. I'm not specifically in that area, but something that I would want to pass on. But right now, you know, all our robots are in a, in a, a sealed area. Thank you very much. For, let me cold call you. So uh, we do need to finish up now, but I did want to leave that question to you. If your organization is using robots, think about how this can change the way you think about them. You know, I actually, we used to be a robot salesman for uh, General Electric a long time ago. And the way we thought about applying that automation was very limited. Um, now what I think your work has, has done, Professor Shah, has really opened up the possibilities of having the robots much more integrated into the operation, mm -hmm. but also learning. Absolutely. And um, I just think that we haven't really thought about it that way. We thought about it as a solution to a specific problem. So anyways, I, I leave that with you. Yes, you know, Manny, you want to weigh in. Okay, here you go. And I'm Manny from Intel. One of the robot assisted uh, is what we see also see in the assisted living. Mm -hmm. And Intel kind of works in that space where uh, for Alzheimer's or people who you know like have uh, you know needing help, they won't be able to do every, everything by themselves. They have to work with the kind of robots, not necessarily that looking, but different. But uh, they will do some of it. The robot will do the rest of it, and uh, so that that's being also tried out currently. So, just want to share that. Thank you, Manny. So I'll leave you with some homework, and I'll say thank you very much, Professor thank Shah. Thank you.